We're now going to continue to talk about Ravenna in the fifth century. Uh, and uh, we'll look at two baptistries and the mausoleum of uh, Theodoric the Ostrogoth. Um, a little bit of historical background. Uh, Theodoric the Great, the king of the Ostrogoths, conquered Ravenna in 493. Now, one of the things you need to realize is the Ostrogoths were Christians, but they were Arian Christians. And you'll remember that Arius, uh, the theologian who lived um, approximately 250 to 336, uh, was condemned at the Council of Nicaea. And Arius had said, you know, that you know, Christ was not co-eternal with God the Father, that he was a created being, and that the Father made him God the Son because of his righteousness. So you have variant views of Christianity. Uh, the Orthodox faith considers that to be a heresy. Um, and one of the interesting things is how the Christians treated uh, the people who had different views of Christianity, and it, it varied. Um, the Orthodox faith was not as tolerant as Theodoric originally was. Um, Originally, Theodoric was tolerant of the Orthodox Christians, and these would be uh, the Byzantine Church, the Roman Church. They not, were not separate at this point. Uh, but uh, they, when they started persecuting and, uh, and denouncing him, uh, then uh, he changed his practices. Um, just a run through of how the, what happened with the kingdom of the Ostrogoths. In 493, Theodoric the Great uh, conquered Ravenna and Italy. Ostensibly, he was the viceroy for the Byzantine emperor, but essentially he was setting up a kingdom of Ostrogoths in Italy. And so Theodoric uh, ruled Italy from 493 to 526. Um, when he died in 526, his daughter, not quite sure how you pronounce this, Amalasuntha, Amalasuntha, became the regent queen of the Goths for her minor son, Othalaric. And then Othalaric died in 534, and his mother um, ruled with her cousin, Theohad, Theodahad, who had her imprisoned and then murdered in 535. In 535, Belisarius, who was the very famous general for the Eastern Emperor Justinian, uh, conquered Ravenna and restores Italy to the empire. Although the Goths did reestablish themselves in Italy uh, through the mid-century, uh, but so now um, Ravenna becomes a Byzantine, uh, a Byzantine ruled city again. One of the things you'll find is that there are some buildings that are built for the Aryan faith, the Aryan Christians. Uh, others are built for the Orthodox Christians. Uh, and uh, when Byzantium conquers, uh, some of the buildings that were built uh, by, uh, built under the reign of Theodoric are taken over for Orthodox use and some of the, direct, uh, the decorations may be changed. And of course, sometimes there's a, a question about uh, what was done for the Arians and what was done for uh, the uh, Orthodox faith. Well, here are two baptistries. And uh, because they had different theology, uh, the Arians and the Orthodox uh, Christians did not share baptistries. Uh, and as I said, uh, Theodoric originally was quite tolerant of having you know, two different kind of ideas, even though he was an Arian. Uh, later on, that did change. Uh, but you're looking at the outside of both of these. Uh, the Orthodox baptistry, which was built in the fourth century. 
Uh, and then the interior, which we'll be looking at, was remodeled uh, in the mid-fifth century, uh, 450 to 60, uh, by the Bishop Neon. And so it's sometimes called the Neonian Baptistry. Uh, the Orthodox Baptistry was built around 500 uh, after Theodoric uh, conquered Ravenna. Uh, and, of course, was used for uh, people of the or Aryan uh, Christian faith. Both of them are based on an octagon, as uh, most baptistries would be, uh, going clear back to the Lateran baptistry, uh, St. John Lateran, which is an octagon. And so there is this uh, tradition of uh, eight-sided baptistries. Uh, you might notice they're also built of these uh, sort of long, thin, uh, bricks that you find uh, in uh, uh, the architecture in Ravenna. Okay, we're looking at the inside of the Orthodox or the Neonian Baptistry from the uh, mid fifth century. And you can see that this uh, is richly decorated. Uh, there is marble. Uh, there's stucco at the second level, where you're seeing uh, some of these reliefs of uh, saints. And uh, there are beautiful mosaics uh, in the spandrels and uh, in the dome, which we'll be taking a look at. And there is a very, very large marble font in the center. Both of them are based on an octagon, like the Lateran Baptistry. The Lateran Baptistry is the original Constantinian Baptistry from the fourth century. It's attached to the Church of St. John Lateran in Rome, and it is an octagon, uh, which is domed, and then there is this octagonal font in the center. Uh, eight was considered the symbolic number for the resurrection, and baptism was considered to be the rebirth into new life. Uh, when you are baptized, your sins are wiped out and you are reborn into the new life of the Christian faith. Because this was the original Constantinian baptistry and it's attached to the Cathedral of Rome, uh, it was often imitated in the idea of having eight sides for a baptistry. And of course, this continues for centuries and centuries. So here we're looking at uh, the Neonian or Orthodox Baptistry. It's built in the late 4th century. Uh, in the mid-5th century, 450 to, six, uh, 450 to 460, uh, the, wooden, the original wooden ceiling was replaced with a pendentive dome, which we'll see when we look at the inside. Uh, he redecorated it, uh, installed these blind arches, uh, you can see these sort of double arches uh, that uh, are filled in with masonry, uh, which makes it a, a more interesting surface on the exterior. We're looking at the interior of the Orthodox Baptistry. It's also known as the Neonian Baptistry after Bishop Neon. And as you can see, it is richly decorated. There is a large marble font in the center. It's, of course, eight-sided. And then on the walls and the ceiling, uh, the, the uh, dome, uh, you have uh, marble, you have stucco, uh, that's up in the second level where you see uh, these reliefs of, of uh, figures. Uh, and then you have mosaics. The mosaics, uh, beautifully colored, are in the spandrels of the arcade and they are on the dome above. As we look up to the window level, the uh, second level, uh, you can see these uh, stucco Old Testament prophets uh, prophesying the coming of the Messiah. So we're looking up to the second level, the window level, uh, where you see uh, a relief sculpture made in stucco uh, of the Old Testament prophets foretelling the coming of the Messiah. One of the things you may notice is that there's a hierarchy in decoration. And this is very, very true, as we'll see, of Byzantine churches and how they develop. Um, you could almost think of them as concentric circles or concentric octagons rising to the highest uh, heavenly point. Uh, on the lowest level, 
there are inscriptions. Okay. Uh, and these inscriptions are from the Psalms and the Gospels, and they're related to baptism, where you enter the church. And then as you move up to the second level, the window level, uh, you see Old Testament prophets foretelling the coming of the Messiah. And uh, they are crafted in stucco. And then you move up to the mosaic ring above the pendentives, at the base of the dome, and you see alternating images of altars and thrones. And here you see a detail of the waiting throne. This is the uh, this is throne is surmounted by a cross, and it is waiting for the second coming of Christ. Then there is another concentric circle, and this shows the apostles, the disciples of Christ, uh, plus uh, Saint uh, uh, Saint Paul, uh, in paradise. And uh, they are uh, separated by this kind of uh, abstracted foliage. Uh, and they're holding uh, crowns, uh, you know, like crowns of martyrdom, or just heavenly crowns. And here we have the detail of St. Peter. Incidentally, you can tell he's Peter not only because he's labeled, as you see, Petrus, Peter in Latin, uh, but also Peter has a particular physiognomy. Uh, he's generally represented as a man with a gray or white squared beard, and very often with a tonsure. Uh, St. Paul, on the other hand, usually is shown with a long black beard. So now we're looking up into the central dome, and you can see, of course, uh, the apostles, uh, which we looked at a detail a minute ago. But in the very center, you have the baptism of Christ. So we're getting closer at this. Uh, you see uh, Christ in the River Jordan, uh, with the sort of the uh, uh, way that they would show transparency. Uh, you can see his uh, legs under the water. And John is standing there uh, pouring water on the head of Christ, and the dove of the Holy Spirit descend. And then on the far right, you have this figure, which we have a detail of, which is the river god, uh, the personification of the Jordan River. Now, of course, uh, they're Christians. They don't believe that there is a river god for the Jordan or any other river. But this is the classical way of showing a river. And so once again, um, iconography from the classical tradition continues. Uh, as I said, you can think of it as a personification of the river. One of the interesting things is you can see the attempt to show shading. Uh, See on the arms and the pectorials of the, uh, of the river god. Uh, so here there is also a continuation of uh, the classical tradition, but of course the forms are becoming more linear. And you may have noticed uh, with the apostles that they're becoming more elongated. Theodoric the Ostrogoths, the king of the Ostrogoths, or the Eastern Goths, conquered Ravenna in 493. The Ostrogoths were Christians. They were Arian Christians. And you may remember that Arius was the theologian who was condemned at the Council of Nicaea because his idea was that Christ was not co-eternal with God the Father. He was a created being. He was born very long ago. Uh, he assisted in the creation of the world, but he was uh, a created being. Uh, the Ostrogoths were Arian Christians, and you may remember uh, that Arius and his beliefs were condemned at the Council of Nicaea. Uh, but of course, many people continued to believe uh, this version of Christianity. And Arius uh, said that Christ was a created being. He was not co-eternal with God the Father. Now, a little bit about Theodoric the Ostrogoth. Uh, he had been a hostage to the Byzantines. Uh, he was actually educated in Constantinople. And at age 18, he returned to uh, the Goths who were, were living near the Black Sea. Uh, in 487 to 93, he led the Ostrogoths into North Italy. 
and he set up the kingdom of the Ostrogoths. It was a period in Italy of peace and prosperity, and at first it was a period of religious tolerance. But later, as the Byzantines began to persecute the Arians, uh, Theodoric began to retaliate. And as we said, uh, the Arians would want a separate baptistry. They would appoint uh, separate bishops uh, of their own faith. So we also have uh, the Arian baptistry in Ravenna. It likewise is an octagon, uh, but the interior today is not richly decorated. Uh, there is no surviving decorations on the walls. Um, what you have are uh, the, the brickwork. Presumably it would have at least been stuccoed uh, or plastered, but uh, we, we don't know what was on the walls. What does survive uh, it is a mosaic on the ceiling, on the dome. So here we're looking at the uh, dome of the Arian Baptistry, and you can see that the iconography, uh, the subject matter, is very similar uh, to what you saw with the Orthodox Baptistry. You have a ring of apostles in heaven holding crowns. Uh, you have one waiting throne rather than a whole ring of them. Uh, as the throne between Peter and Paul. And in the center you have a baptism of Christ. We're looking at uh, a detail of uh, Saints Paul and Peter on either side of the waiting throne surmounted by a cross. Uh, and you can see that that throne looks very, very much like the throne in the uh, Orthodox baptistry. And undoubtedly, uh, the mosaics in the Arian baptistry were influenced by those of the Orthodox baptistry. Uh, you'll notice that the style um, tends toward uh, more simplification. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. Most of the apostles are holding the crowns of the martyrs. St. Paul, with his black beard, is holding a scroll. And St. Peter, with his white beard, uh, is holding the keys of the kingdom of heaven. You'll remember that uh, Christ uh, says that uh, you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. They're wearing white robes and have a golden background and uh, uh, stylized trees separate uh, each of the apostles. Uh, it's interesting, you have uh, some cast shadows at their feet, but you have a greater simplification of the figures and their draperies. The style has become more abstract, more linear, more simplified. Uh, so these figures, although they certainly can still turn in space, you can see uh, Peter and Paul reaching across themselves, uh, their arms reaching across their bodies, that is. Uh, but the drapery folds really just look like lines. Uh, so there's another step toward uh, greater abstraction here. Here we're looking at the uh, center of the dome, the baptism of Christ, uh, the iconographic elements are the same, but uh, a bit more centralized. Uh, Christ is here in the center. He is beardless. And the dove of the Holy Spirit is coming directly down uh, above. Uh, in this case, we have St. John the Baptist on our right. <laughs> Uh, and the river god is showing uh, you know, a complete form rather than partially hidden by the water. Uh, and uh, he is on the left. And I think, once again, you can see that these figures seem to have outlines. Uh, and there is this interesting movement toward a more abstract conception of art. Um, the Aryan figures are more stylized with dark outlines. Uh, the orthodox figure, as you can see here, has bands of tesserae in different shades. And here we're comparing uh, the uh, orthodox baptistry. You see uh, with Peter and Paul, 
uh, more detail, more shading, more color, uh, perhaps more movement with the Orthodox baptistry. And then the forms are simplified. They are very, very clear. And shading has been reduced uh, pretty much to a line of darker tesserae. So once again, greater abstraction with the uh, Arian baptistry. Why is the style of the Arian baptistry different from the Orthodox? And so here are some of the theories. We don't know, of course, one absolute answer. One reason that has been speculated is that Gothic art, so-called barbarian art, uh, would be more abstract. Uh, that the Goths, uh, it, before they settled down in a particular place in Italy, uh, had uh, for their art portable jewelry with abstract designs and had uh, no illusionistic tradition. So they're basing their images of human beings uh, and other objects from the natural world on uh, Roman art and uh, they stylize it. Another idea was simply money. Uh, Bishop Neon had greater financial resources. He could hire and import the leading artisans. And uh, Theodoric is building the baptistry of the Arians after the war and possibly using local craftsmen. Another idea is that it's simply stylistic development. The Arian baptistry mosaics are created decades later than those of the Orthodox or Neonian baptistry. And they are a step closer uh, temporally and uh, stylistically to the abstract linear style that becomes what we consider to be the Byzantine style, the style of the Orthodox Christians uh, and of the Byzantine or Eastern Empire. Let's work at uh, one more monument uh, uh, associated with the time of Theodoric. Uh, this is the monumental tomb of Theodoric the Great the king of the Ostrogoths. Uh, here we're looking at a cross section of the tomb. And you can see there's an upper chamber, a lower chamber. The mausoleum of Theodoric was based on the circular imperial tombs, particularly on the tomb of Hadrian in Rome. Hadrian's tomb has a 12-sided base, a decagon, and then uh, the uh, part above that becomes circular. So the mausoleum of Theodoric is not exactly the same, uh, but as you can see here, uh, it has a, it is a it is a twelve-sided building, uh, and it has its. Uh, polygonal section below and its uh, circular section above. And then it is crowned with the most amazing dome. Uh, the mausoleum of Theodore has the most amazing dome. Most domes uh, would be made of uh, stone or brick put together. Uh, the dome of the Pantheon is concrete, poured. And uh, the much smaller dome of the Neonian baptistry is made up of hollow tubular tiles set in concrete. But evidently, the builders for Theodoric, perhaps they didn't know how to put together a dome. What they did instead was carve a dome from one piece of stone. it weighs 300 tons. I have no idea. <laughs> well, they obviously were able to lift it on top. Um, you'll notice that there are almost like uh, loops or handles at the top. Uh, it has been suggested that these uh, help where the, the that these would be the place to help lift it up. Each one of them is inscribed with the uh, names of the apostles. So they represent uh, the holy apostles, and that makes a connection to the tomb of Constantine 
in Constantinople, the tomb of the Holy Apostles, uh, where Constantine had himself buried as, the, as he saw, the 13th Apostle. Uh, so Theodoric is using a, a similar idea. Uh, there is some carved decoration, as you can see, a frieze at the base of the dome, uh, and it's a kind of pincer uh, decoration.